Howdy. Howdy. Now, I originally was uh, considering having a title of this talk of plant sex and selection, but I decided that probably was a little too risque to put in print for such a cultured audience. Um, so what I'd like to talk to you about today is some of the tremendous gains we've seen in agriculture, a little bit of why, and a little bit of where we're going. And so if you look at this figure, it really shows something dramatic. This is actually USDA yield data. So that's the amount of production per unit area, bushels per acre in the case of corn, for instance, in the United States between the period of 1870 to 2010. And what you'll see is that a few crops, notably uh, corn, rice, sorghum, have had eight to tenfold increases, if we include potatoes in that, uh, over this period of years. So that's really dramatic because it means that we can produce 10 times as much food on the same land area, or conversely, we need tenfold as uh, much land area to produce the same amount of food. So where did these crops come from? You know, how did they get to this point to begin with? And so Jack Harlan, who's uh, a very noted uh, since past member of the National Academy, said uh, that he believed that our ancestors would go out and harvest wild species from nature. They would consume them, and some of it, they didn't quite finish their meal. And they would throw that in the refuse pile. And over uh, the, the history of that refuse pile, the ancestors that followed them noticed that some of the best and most attractive versions of that wild species would emerge. And so they st soon started going to that refuse pile to pick improved varieties of what they were harvesting from the wild. And this happened about 10,000 years ago in, in Mexico for maize, about 10,000 years ago in Africa for sorghum, and uh, about 10,000 years ago in the Fertile Crescent for, for wheat. So very consistent across uh, species. Now what I'm showing you here on the far left side is commercial maize harvested from my field here in Texas. Next to that is the wild species it was domesticated from, or a very closely related species. And those look like little rocks. They look like pebbles that you wouldn't necessarily want to eat. And so one of the things we've done is we've made crosses with these. And that's what's shown in that next uh, corn by wild species hybrid. And you can see we quickly recover something that looks quite a bit like corn. Looks like you could eat it, although the ears are very small. And then over time, we can pull out things that look just like corn, except they have some of the beneficial characteristics of that wild species, which I'm going to visit with you about in a little bit. Now, one of the things that's shocking to a lot of people uh, is that we have tremendous diversity among our crops. And so this is just a picture of some of the native races of maize throughout the Americas that our ancestors uh, developed and bred and now are being grown by native cultures. And so we can use this to improve our crops. So a common question is, well, how do you improve your crops? You know, how do you breed crops? And the simple answer is we turn the lights way down low, we put some berry white on, and we let the magic happen. But the more technical answer is it really depends on the crop. And if we look at corn, it actually has a separate male and female part to the plant. And so that makes breeding a little bit easier. If we look at sorghum, it has complete flowers. So the uh, male and female part are within the same flower, and so it's a little more tricky. So what we do is we put on a bag on the ear, which is what you'd buy in the supermarket with the kernels, and then those stringy silk things. Those are the, the female part, the receptive part. We'll put a bag over that, basically a female condom to protect stray pollen from contaminating, the, contaminating that ear. And then we'll go out and find a plant we like and collect the pollen from that and make controlled pollinations. And in sorghum, we've got to use some tricks like hand emasculation or some genetic male sterility. But it's really basically the same idea. So through this, we can do scientific breeding. And that's really where this explosion happened. It was through this process of discovering Mendelian genetics and understanding how to scientifically breed crops that we've made this huge gain in, in yield. Um, I should note, though, that the gains in yield have been about 50% due to plant breeding or genetic improvement of plants, and about 50% due to agronomy or changes in cultural practices, changes in planting and harvesting equipment, changes in fertilization, as we heard earlier. But that's what's made uh, us be so productive with our agricultural system. And that's really critical as we look towards, say, 2050, where we're expected to have something like 3 billion more people on Earth. Now, Norman Borlaug was a real champion of this. And some of you may see Norman Borlaug's name around the Texas A&M campus because he ended his career here as a faculty member. But he's also one of the few agricultural scientists who won uh, a Nobel Peace Prize, or a Nobel Prize at all, for his work. 
He's known as the father of the Green Revolution, and he really championed this idea that we need to be able to feed all citizens of the world, and we're going to increasingly have more of those. But that's not our only problem, and I think as, as plant scientists, we really recognize that. We have a, 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 a myriad of challenges in ecosystem service provision. When you're growing annual monocultures, there are going to be some times of the year where you don't have the soil covered. And when we're fertilizing crops like we do, there's going to be some spillover into our waterways, just like there is in our cities. That contaminates our waterways, eventually contaminating the ocean. But we as plant breeders can do better than that, and we can use science to improve these things. We also know that with a changing climate, our plants are going to have to face different challenges in the future than they currently face. And that's predicted to decrease yield further. So we're trying to use science to do that. And finally, we know that people really want to eat healthier food. And so we can use science to improve the health of our crops. Now this just shows one example of something I'm working on in my research program. And on the uh, upper left hand corner is Zia diplo perennis, a wild perennial relative of corn. On, the, uh, on your right hand side here is domesticated corn. And this is harvested down in Westlaco, uh, Texas, down on the Mexico border, which is where we have our winter nursery, in December. And so one of those plants is still actively photosynthesizing, still retaining soil, still providing habitat for insects and other life, and the other one is not. And we can make crosses and recover something uh, that looks a little bit promising in the middle. But the pace of change in plant breeding is very slow, and that's something that I have a hard time getting across to people, where we get uh, cell phone updates every six months. There's a new version of a cell phone. And so what I'm showing on the left-hand side here is the most popular cell phone, seven, or second most popular cell phone, seven years ago, and the second most popular cell phone today. And during that same time, you can imagine how many iterations, how many uh, engineering improvements have been made. But in plant breeding, we can only make one, and that's if we really push it and with a lot of funding, one new version uh, of, of uh, plant variety. And that's just due to the slow change of sexual selection. Now I'm only going to show one equation, and it's only to be illustrative. We're not going to actually calculate anything here. But we call this the breeder's equation. And the breeder's equation basically tells us how to take shortcuts in improving our plants and, uh, and making more genetic gain over time. And so we can increase selection intensity by growing more plants. We can increase our selection accuracy by measuring plants better. We can increase the genetic variance, or, or how much uh, genetic variation there is by better using and characterizing genetic diversity. And finally, we can create more seasons per year, cycle things more rapidly. And so what I'm going to go through is some of the technologies that are enab enabling us to improve this equation and do those things we're talking about. One of these is a lot more coordination. Field experiments have gone from being just in one small research program to being national, or in some cases of, of companies, global. And that's allowing us to have a look at a lot more plants and do a lot better job at selection intensity and selecting better plants. The other technology that's revolutionized every aspect of society is genomics. And when I started as a graduate student, we would run gels and collect a few base pairs, let's say, of, of, of DNA a day. But sequencing is one of the few technologies that's actually exceeded Moore's law of semiconductors. And now we look at what can be captured in a two-week period, billions, billions, and billions of bases. So we can use those in our breeding program. We can run genetic analysis on the individual plants, and we can measure those plants, and we can use that to map genes. And so what I'm showing you here on the x-axis are the chromosomes of corn. On the y-axis is the significance. And we can see a number of Mendelian traits that pop out from a breeding population that we have. We have the P1 gene for red cob. So that gene conditions whether or not the cob color is red. And we have the Y1 gene for yellow grain. And if you like blue tortilla chips, there's two genes that control blue corn. But we can go into other quality traits, like ecosystem service provision, yield, health. Those things we can map and use to scientifically improve plants. Now the other thing we're doing, and it's a really interesting, exciting project, with uh, aerospace engineering and mechanical engineering and geosciences um, and ag engineering is using new technology to image our crops. That's going to allow us to collect more data and better data, but it's also going to allow us to, to screen more plants. So for instance, using UAVs, fixed wing and rotor wing aircraft with imaging cameras, or using sensors on ground platforms. So we can screen a lot more plants and we can be more efficient in our selection, keeping that rate of gain going up. 
Now, just to give you an example, uh, this is from Soren Popovsky's program. This is a height a representation of one of my fields this last summer. And currently in my, in my program, if we wanted to take measurements, we would have to hire an army of undergrads, right? Which would increase the cost or to increase their time. Or we could take a shortcut. We could measure something a little more simply and that would decrease the quality. So we have this typical trade-off of you know, time, cost, and quality. But with this technology, with this imaging technology, we're actually able to move up a pyramid so we're decreasing that trade-off between time, cost, and quality, allowing us to make more measurements. And it's starting in the field, then we're going to more automated greenhouse methods, but eventually the field will be fully automated. And we were talking about labor a little bit earlier. Uh, measuring plants on 105 degree day is not something a lot of people sign up for. But if any of you want to, I'm always hiring. <laughs> now, are these technologies really gonna make a difference? Now, uh, people in uh, marketing use this Gartner hype cycle a lot. And I really think it's an illustrative example of how to think about new technology. So we have the technology trigger. There's some new technology. Everybody gets really excited about it, and there's this peak of inflated expectations. This is going to save the world. It's going to change everything. It's going to be amazing. And then over time, there's this trough of disillusionment. Well, it's not really working out. You know, the world wasn't changed overnight. Maybe we should give up on it. But meanwhile, some of us continue to keep working on it. We have the slope of enlightenment, and eventually there's a plateau of productivity where it makes a real change for people for you. So plant breeding is clearly one of those things. Scientific plant breeding's been around for 100 years. Domestication for 10,000. But some of these new technologies, these high throughput phenotyping, these UAVs in agriculture, you'll see a lot in the popular press. Um, but really, it's going to take a while before we know if they're going to work. Genomics is working already, though. So ultimately, as I started out saying, we really would love to be able to improve the health, the taste, the environmental sustainability, and the yield of crops. And if we think about what our ancestors have done and what recent science, uh, scientific um, organizations and, and companies have done, we've changed that little wild tomato into that big tomato. And we can now go into this collection of diversity and pull out healthful traits or traits that are just fun. And when we look at some of the things that are possible in terms of soil retention from perennial crops, there's a number of us who are working on trying to breed perennial crops that would retain the soil, photosynthesize, uh, and provide ecosystem services. All these things can be done, and we're going to be able to do them better with some of these enabling plant breeding technologies. So I guess the last thing I want to lead you with is, uh, is something that really just shocks uh, a lot of my colleagues and I, which is why the public loves technology so much in every aspect of our life. We want the new car. We want the new cell phone. But when it comes to food, we get scared. And I think the most ridiculous picture on the internet I've ever seen is a cyber woman with corn here. Um, that's not, you can't even plant those seeds. There's absolutely nothing you can do with that. I'm not sure who dreamed that up, but that is not what we do. What I was explaining today, the natural process of uh, selection and making crosses and using technology to do a better job of that, that's the vast majority of what plant breeding is and how we're going to continue to improve agriculture into the next century. So I'll end there and thank you. <laughs>